we'll start. Um, again, if you just joined us, thank you so much. Sorry about those password issues. Um, I set this all up, all those other passwords, like very long ago, it seems. <laughs> um, our participants, everyone's people are still joining kind of rapidly, so. And it's so nice to see all the other faces of everybody. I'm sorry we all can't be together in person this weekend, but this is the next best thing, I think. Definitely. I'm just glad we're doing something on Rhinebeck weekend. The thought of being home and not doing anything to celebrate would be too sad. No, I think I think that's true. And like yesterday it was all rainy and I thought like, oh God, like unloading today would have been awful. But then this morning it's gorgeous. So it would have been, it would have all been worth it. All right, our participants are steadily climbing. Um, but I think I'm going to begin. Um, just so everybody knows we are recording we are recording this. I hope we'll be able to post it um, later. And, and I will confirm that with everybody before. Um, again, I want to say thank you to everybody who's joining us. It's been such a pleasure to be in contact with so many of you over the past couple of weeks and to be uh, in contact with our panelists who are giving their time um, just to be able to be here with you and with us for, um, for this talk. So. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then and then we're going to start. So, um, Clara Parks, as most of you know, is a writer, a founder of Knitters Review, and a wool expert. Her latest book, Vanishing Fleece, um, traced the journey of raw wool um, on the actual sheep to the finished yarn that she had held in her hand. Um, we also have Christina Rodeba with us. She is a writer, artist, and crafter. Um, working at the intersection of fiber arts, so sustainability and fashion. Most recently, she's focused on a personal project called Make Thrift Mend, developing techniques in mending, plant dyes, and sustainable fashion. She teaches workshops, writes books and essays, and offers limited edition kits and fiber goods on her site. We have her book, Mending Matters, right here. Um, she has two other books, The Paper Playhouse and Make Thrift and Mend, which is coming in April in the spring of this year, which is really exciting. Um, Hannah Thiessen is a knitter, designer, and writer whose two books, Slow Knitting and Seasonal Slow Knitting, um, seek to bring awareness to every moment of the process. Oh my God, Hannah, I pasted your, I pasted my intro in and not yours. And here is Hannah's book. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sonia Phillip is a teacher, designer, and author. Um, she, stud she started 100 Acts of Sewing in 2012 and believes that making clothes is a vitally important skill. Her first book will be published also in the spring of 2021. We're really excited for that. Um, Kathy Hattori is the founder and president of Botanical Colors, a natural dye supplier for artisans and commercial customers. And she works closely with designers, dyers, and sustainability brands. They also have a natural dye production studio in Seattle, Washington. Um, and then Christine, Behar and Adrian Rodriguez own a natural dyeing studio, yarn and fabric shop in Oakland, California um, called A Verb for Keeping Warm, which I love. Um, Christine is the author of The Modern Natural Dyer, which I don't have a copy of in my hand right now, I'm so sorry. Um, and they're all the authors of the new book, Journeys in Natural Dyeing, which also is on its way to us. I don't know why, um, but that's available now and we'll have those in stock in the next few days to be able to ship out to you, I've been promised. So. Um, so, so thank you. Um, so that's who we are. And um, we're going to just start, um, all the panelists are going to kind of sort of go around and just talk about um, what sustainability means to them and how are they engaging with that practice of sustainability. So Christi uh, Katrina, do you wanna start? Okay. Sure, <laughs> if you want me to. Hi. <clears throat> Um, I'm Katrina Rodeball, and um, we, can you repeat the question, Kara? What oh, does this? I think what we I, we had said, but you can speak to whatever you want. But I think we had said we were just wanted to start with just what is this idea of sustainability, and how is that something that's active in your practice, both as a as a person and as a as a craftsperson? Um, so I'm lately kind of at odds with the word sustainable and also the word slow fashion, but I'll use those words because I haven't come up with better words yet. Um, so yeah, right now my, um, work is focused on this intersection of fiber arts, 
and fashion and sustainability and uh, mostly through mending and plant dyes and um, working with sustainability in my wardrobe. Although I feel like my sustainable journey started over 20 years ago. Um, I was an environmental studies major in college and spent that next decade kind of looking closely at food and um, food systems and working for arts organizations. And I left fashion out of my journey. So fashion has really um, been my focus with environmentalism for the last seven years since the Rana Plaza factory uh, collapsed in Dhaka, Bangladesh in 2013. So I think it's uh, sort of this dance for me between my personal life and um, you know two decades of sort of personal practice around our food and our home and really only in sort of like the last seven years has my fiber arts studio and uh, sustainable fashion sort of merged into a professional journey as well. Um, I guess I will go next. Um, my name is Clara Parks and um, I come from a, a, a slightly different angle from Katrina in that um, I started more, I, I also have, because it's, it's about so much. It's about, um, for me, it's about being mindful of the, being mindful of the full life cycle of anything that I bring into my life now and where I sit in that life cycle. So it's no longer like, yay, I ordered a new pair of shoes and they arrived at my house. It's more like, what went into this pair of shoes? Whose work went into these shoes? Am I willing to hold on to this item for the duration of its life with me? And am I willing to be responsible to carry it on? So it's just being more mindful of what I bring into the house and what it's made of. Are the materials sustainable? Is the harvesting of them sustainable? Is the turning of them into fabric sustainable? I mean, it's, it's, there's so much, the world is, hugely vast. I know you know that, but that's, that's kind of where, where I am with it. So I can jump in here. Um, generally for me, the idea of sustainability is such a huge thing because on a global level, there's no way that I as an individual can make enough of an impact and enough of a change to change like the global sustainable issues that we're having. So when I talk about sustainability in my work or my practice, which is mainly knitting and a little bit of play in different areas like natural dyeing or sewing, usually I'm just talking about what I can do on an individual level to be more conscientious of the production, the process, the ingredients, my time spent with things, recognizing areas that I can stretch myself further than maybe someone else would be able to based on my privilege of where I live in my kind of accessibility to things. So sustainability for me is about personal choices that make my practice more holistic, but also more considerate of others, whether those others are animals or people or places. It, it all kind of comes together in a whole thing for me. I'm Kathy Hattori and um, sustainability is, is, is a loaded word as uh, a couple of you guys have said already. Um, I'm actually looking at um, probably the most unsustainable um, industry other than I would say the petroleum industry, which is textile and clothing manufacture and um, trying to build natural dye um, projects, practices and procedures in a very unsustainable um, industry. So for us at Botanical Colors, it's, it's really fraught because we're looking at a cycle where a brand, a clothing brand doesn't exist unless they're always selling. And now they're trying to figure out how do they become more circular, circular meaning that they do think about all of those issues of supply, effort, impact, and all the uses that they have of energy, water, chemistry, um, and all the communities that they impact in sewing, um, dyeing, growing, etc. And then what does that mean for them? Most of them are stumbling pretty badly. Um, I would say there's a couple that are 
starting to kind of move away from the pack and and we've been fortunate to be able to work with them on a certain level but yeah it's so easy of a word to greenwash and pretend like you're being as mindful as possible when you have technically a completely unmindful procedure so um there's a lot of i think for me there's a lot of personal conflict in it's expressed in the fact that, you know, we're basically now only eating as locally as we possibly can um, and trying really hard to not buy too much stuff because it's just feeling really overwhelming. So it's exhilarating and it's completely crushing at the same time. And it's an interesting place to be. Hi. We're not. Okay. It's, okay. Hello. Um, my name is Adrian Rodriguez, and I am the co-owner of A Bird for Keeping Warm. And this is Christine Behar. And um, you know, a few kind of uh, key words or topics um, that I think about when I think about sustainability. I think about uh, resources. Um, whether that be like uh, energy, water, materials, land. Um, definitely thinking about materials and the impact that it has on the earth um, and the people on it and the animals and the plants and the fungi. Um, definitely thinking about constantly what the environmental impact is of whatever I am interacting with, whether that be food or clothing, housing, transportation. Um, and then I also think about uh, sustainability in, in the context of health. I think of mental health, um, human health. Um, you know, a lot of people have talked about pollution, you know, waterways uh, being polluted, water sources being polluted, um, and human, human health and community, uh, this was mentioned textiles, uh, have been a source of slave labor, poor working conditions, um, and death and suffering. And so sustainability for me is really, uh, a main, main maintaining a, a sense of, uh, health, not only for yourself, but others and the world around us and respecting all of those and having value. And then uh, Christine's going to speak about how we integrate that into our life. Yeah, so I mean, it's definitely a day to day kind of mindfulness. Um, uh, I, I'll say it can be overwhelming at times, I think, um, for those of us who are really trying to pay attention to this. Um, and so sometimes um, honing in on just a couple small things a day um, that one can do. Um, so yeah, I mean, here at Verb, um, you know, we definitely have that um, tug of war of, again, like kind of, um, sorry, our store is open for curbside pickup. And so someone's talking, I'm sorry. Um, but that, uh, you know, we're here and we're in business and we're selling and that's how we stay alive. And um, that's hard when, you know, we feel that conflict like with capitalism and um, what can be happening there due to it. Um, and so, what are other ways to restructure or yeah, to rebalance? Um, we ask ourselves those questions daily. Um, so, you know, like certain things that we've been doing throughout the years are just trying to walk closer and closer to the sources of where we get things from and meeting those people in person. Um, and so we know and can hear from them what their lives are like. Um, instead of hearing it like secondhand or thirdhand um, or presupposing what someone's life is like, 
really allowing them to tell us what their life is like, um, and then kind of coming back and reflecting and thinking about the impact of where we're at in that. And so it's a constantly moving um, conversation. Um, and so a big part has been, you know, with our yarn, for example, and some of our fabrics and what have you, um, really, you know, digging deep and dialing down into working with farmers um, and uh, people who own mills. Um, all of our yarn is naturally dyed and, you know, some of those dyes are imported. Um, we've started raising some of our dyes. So working with local farmers on growing dyes um, on local organic farms. And then, you know, it gets pretty complicated pretty fast in terms of cost and pricing structures, um, especially that we live in California, a very expensive place to live. Um, so, and then there's, you know, resource issues here. So is it um, applicable to actually grow indigo here with the amount of water that it needs? Um, should we not be doing that? So, you know, and then what do customers want and how do we continue? Um, buying time essentially to see if we can steer the ship to a, a place where we have more of a vision. Um, yeah, and so like with our new book, Journeys in Natural Dying, a big part of that was continuing that and looking at our dyes and trying to walk more closely to if we have a dye that's imported, like let's say cochineal, who's the person who's growing the cochineal? What do their lives look like? Um, and uh, we write about that in the book. Um, and then we uh, focus on what you can dye within your block. Um, so we made over 400 color samples um, of dyes that for the most part we foraged and gathered within um, a couple miles of our house. Um, and then we give instruction to do that in your own local environment, knowing that each of our own local environments are going to be slightly different. Um, and all of us have color that's around us. Um, so yeah, and through that process, we got to know many more of our plants and our trees, our mushrooms. Um, so kind of growing again more intimately um, with the land that's right here in front of us. Um, so, you know, I think like what Kathy said, that kind of hyper local, like continuing to just and meeting your community, you know, so a great place to get dye is from people who prune trees. Um, so you could meet, you know, people who are pruning trees, community gardens. Um, so again, really meeting people in your community, um, I think can be uh, rebalancing to the system. Thanks. Thank you. So Sonia um, had some password issues, but I know she's joined us. And so Sonia, you um, would be the next person just to talk. We've just all been kind of sort of saying like what sustainability means in your world um, and to you specifically. And then I think the, the place that I want to go right after that yeah. Um, yeah. is to the one thing that we know that is accessible to everybody, um, which is mending. Um, that's something that everybody, despite you know where they live or what they're um, socioeconomic, um, you know, their, their situation is it's something that is, you know, the most kind of sort of available. Um, so Sonia, do you see, do you see us? I do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Can you hi. hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Hey, Sorry it was about a little that. helter skelter there, but it's like, how many times can I type in sheep and wool, uh, or sheep wool? I don't, <laughs> anyway, I'm here. Uh, crisis averted. Um, you know, I've been nodding along to all the things that everyone else has been saying. I, I hear a lot of my own thoughts. Um, you know, Katrina, I too have had issues with sustainability and slow fashion. I feel like we need a new lexicon for that because it's greatly been co-opted. Um, and then it just becomes like just this empty word of you can just throw it out there and where's the you know, what is all of the work that goes behind it? Um, you know, professionally in my, with my work, I try, as other panelists have said, to really ground it locally. So I try and source materials for the patterns, um, like use recycled paper, use a local printer, um, really try and make it as, you know, so I'm not, 
like offshoring or things like that. That's not always possible. You know, Kira mentioned I have a book that's coming out. It's being published in China. I wish it was published here in the US, but you know, then again, it's like, there's always this fine like tightrope that we're walking when it comes to issues of sustainability, because you know, anytime you go too much one way, it's like, okay, you're tipping into you know, essentially like protectionism. And then you go the other way and you're tipping towards everything being, you know, just people being underpaid and things being cheap and everyone buying things and it being disposable. Um, personally, in my own sort of crafting practice, you know, it's been a real, I don't know, like struggle with trying to mitigate that acquisitiveness of how, you know, they're all the pretty things, all the pretty yarn, all the pretty fabric. And it's just like so many more ideas than I have hours in the day. Um, and so, you know, as it was mentioned, it's this difficult, you know, conundrum when I am selling things of like, okay, how am I contributing in my, my like own capitalist pursuits to people buying more and buying more than they need. Um, I've tried personally, you know, for just years now to be mindful of things as far as like what comes into the house, what can I, you know, can I, do I need these, this item? Uh, can I, can I get it secondhand? Um, can I borrow it instead of buying it? You know, what, what will this, the life of this be? Um, and instead of throwing things away, can I repurpose? Um, which I think then dovetails nicely into the next question of mending, which is, you know, and in a lot of my own personal practice with sewing and sewing clothes, it's, you know, how can I continue the lifespan of my garments. And if something I make is not getting a lot of wear, what can I do to then have it be an active, you know, piece of my wardrobe? How can I take that garment that, you know, I've worn a hole in and keep it going? Um, and that could be mending, that could be remaking. Um, you know, I, I tell people that I, I've been known to just take things apart even after, you know, they've been, even after it's been sewn, washed, worn, um, you know, we don't, we have to get away from the fact that things have to look a certain way or that things have to be you know, perfect. Katrina and I have talked a lot about this uh, and that we can be, you know, experimental and also adventurous in, and that is a way to really like promote a, a more sustainable because like what is what is like sustainability? It is like keeping something going. Uh, and so that what is mending that keeping an article of clothing going, like reweaving the fabric, patching that hole, darning the hole in the sweater, um, and having changing that mindset, which you know, as a child of the 80s, where it was like everything had to be new and shiny and emblazoned with a spree, and you had to get that new thing, um, that it's all right to have clothing that has, you know, meaning, that has a story, that has a past and a history. Um, and I think that that is where mending, remaking, you know, uh, upcycling where that comes from that we can we don't have to necessarily be always shopping and always looking um, you know for that thing to you know that perfect thing that be it you know organizational or something in our closet that will make everything better and you know I can say this but I'm sure I'm not the only person who spent a lot of time during the you know shelter in place doing uh, buying bizarre things that you know because you're like freaked out and it's okay but it's that like trying to move away to a more mindful like all right how is this how is this item going to exist in in my household and why have I bought so much flour uh, anyway I'll move on to the next person to talk about mending. Mute. Yeah, I mean, I think you also bring up a very interesting concept of 
what it means to just be a person in the world and what we're consuming and what we're purchasing and what we're finding and what we're fixing, which is a, is a bigger conversation after. But um, of the panelists for talking, I think a little bit about mending, which is the most accessible, at least starting point. Um, somebody jump in. We also have questions, so. This seems totally like Katrina's kind of question. So I feel like she should definitely talk about it. Um, as far as mending on my point, I have gotten really into darning mainly socks, sweater elbows. I think I love seeing this cycle back towards mending becoming something trendy and cool and artsy. I know that a lot of um, people in my parents' generation and older have a lot of stigmas attached to patched clothing or clothing that went through a lot of wear. There was a lot of shame in wearing mended clothing to school um, during a time period where there was a focus on excess, which I think Sonia really brilliantly touched on. But I think there's a certain amount of magic to the fact that our culture is circling, at least in craft circles, back around to the idea that mending something shows that you value it. Well, I, I, is there a specific question around mending or, or I, just... I, was just, I was hearing everybody as we were talking about the what the breakdown is and what we what we can do and so I think we talked a lot in detail about some of the ways people are like creating new products that are you know using sustainable or whatever practices that are feel local and honor and and kind of sort of balance out right that idea like do you make indigo here like not if it takes so much water you don't but i th i was just thinking that the the one entry level sustainable piece is just mending um and i think hannah just touched on right some of that idea of why there's maybe some stigma attached to it or or we haven't and and maybe we've covered it i just thought it yeah felt like a nice place to start i think um I'm happy to talk about mending, but I think that um, one thing in the last seven years for me that's become clear is that like there's no one size fits all. Like that, that's not even the right phrase, but like there's no one prescriptive way to achieve sustainable fashion, right? And I think actually it's more so if you were like to work with, uh, I don't know, a doctor or uh, some kind of consultant, right? We almost need like to take into consideration like the disposition and constitution of the person and the household, I think before we actually even try to prescribe what is appropriate for them or what is attainable for them or what is possible for them. Um, and really it's, I feel like so much through my students that I've learned that um, and what they, and how generous they are with me about their lives and the complications of their lives. And, you know, I think there's maybe like five or six ways that people are trying to have a lower impact wardrobe. And certainly one part is about where, like care and repair. Um, but for some people that might be like just being more mindful about their laundry right? And about like how they can be thoughtful around the practices of washing and drying clothing. That can have a huge impact on lowering uh, the overall um, resource usage on that garment. I mean, a giant um, reduction. So like that's one side of it. Somebody else might feel really comfortable mending and hand stitching and somebody else might not. And just because they don't have that skill or they don't um, feel comfortable repairing their clothing for whatever reason, um, there's still so many other ways, right? And so for some people that might be just limiting their overall consumption. So it's more of a minimalist wardrobe or a, or a just enough wardrobe, right? And then for other people, it might be just um, thinking more mindfully about the new purchase, regardless of where it's from. If it's from fast fashion, if it's from a independent, you know, slow fashion designer, thinking about the materials that are in that garment and even just thinking like, do I need this? And will I use it? Because again, then we have to consider the person's budget and their geography. I mean, for me to only shop local would not necessarily support the businesses that I wanna support that are doing amazing work in other parts of the country because I live in a very tiny town and I have no local fabric shop at all. I have one massive chain fabric shop within like an hour and a half of me. So I think that it's, it's always this balancing act, but I think more so like when we can get really clear on 
on how we can uh, lessen our impact if we just want to sort of use that phrase. For me, that that like that clarity in my value and in what's available to me, when I can drive from that place, that's where I find to be the most important. And also, like I'm a we have a family of four, right? So my clothing budget for the four of us is going to be very different than someone who's one person, a one person household, right? And so maybe something that I might choose for myself that might feel like a splurge because I want to support that designer, that's not going to be the same choice that I can make with my two young growing kids, right? So I just think that like the more complicated and nuanced that conversation can get and the more we can sort of like assess each household in terms of their budget and their geography and their lifestyle, their profession, their culture, um, their needs and wants, their skill set, I feel like it's almost this like 10 point, right? Um, sort of like analysis. And then there's also just sort of like the tradition of crafting and mending within that family or within that culture. And, and I've been most interested probably in the last year, like how can sustainability go beyond materials? Like if we sort of take that as a starting point, yes, we're looking at where our materials are coming from. We're looking at who we can support by purchasing them. You know, we're looking at synthetics versus biodegradables. Like if we can just kind of assume that, which of course with greenwashing, unfortunately we can't, but if we could, like then how can we go even deeper, right? How can we um, think about supporting communities? I loved what Adrian was saying around like the sort of health and well being of people and places, right? And Kathy obviously has a different viewpoint in working with corporate brands than I do as an individual. And, and what she's gonna be able to offer those corporate brands through consulting is very different than what I can offer one student in a class because that student is a tiny boat that can turn quickly, right? Versus that corporation. So I don't know that that's answering the question about mending, but I think that it, mending is one solution that may or may not be the easiest for the person. Um, I have students, I have, people who contact me who are kind of terrified of mending their own clothing. And I get that they don't want to ruin it or they don't feel like they have the skills. So then, you know, what's some, maybe where someplace else where you can focus your attention if that doesn't feel right. That presents it, I think, really beautifully. Um, just, Clara, were you going to say just, something? Can I just jump in? Sorry, because I wanted to just what Katrina was talking about, that whole idea of the prescriptive nature. Um, and then somebody in the chat was talking about um, using Sashiko and you know we see so much of like Sashiko as the like should we say poster child of visible mending that you know Sashiko has an extremely long history um, of just like decorative stitching as well as um, but you know I don't I am I am I sew with a machine I try and avoid hand sewing as much as possible I just it's not something that I'm like enjoy or I'm good at. Um, and, you know, I very often will like sew myself to uh, whatever I'm mending. Uh, I just, I, I have a skill that way. And so most of my, when I mend, uh, most of my mending is always machine darning. Um, and which I always feel like sets me a bit apart um, from, you know, the beautiful, like carefully worked uh, hand stitching. But you know, yes, it's it's no like it's it's whatever anyone can do and meeting it where wherever anyone is. And my machine darning is a kind of like just get it done and get it patched and quick and dirty. Uh, and that serves my purposes. And it might be that for somebody else that having something to do while they're sitting down and having it be, you know, just slow and meditative that they have the time the skill um, to do that. And, you know, we don't we have to get away from this idea of that, you know, it's just this one, that it only looks this one way. Um, and then if you're not doing it that way, then you're doing it wrong or it's not, you know, it's not right. Uh, Clara, sorry for interrupting. No, oh my God, no, that, that's even, I, I, I love that you sew yourself into things. <laughs> I mean, sorry, hopefully you don't like, not the skin part. Um, no, I, I, I just, uh, I thought Katrina, you put it so beautifully that there are just, there's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, and it's going to be different for every single person. And, um, one thing I was just going to add is, is just the whole idea of, is the material that you're using mendable? Like before you even bring it into your house, what is the, like, is this something that's even going to last long enough to hold a repair. <laughs> so it's the, the quality of your materials, but also just 
the fact that we're putting mending in the conversation for, for so many people, I'd say for like the current consumer generation, just the notion of repairing your clothes instead of dumping it in the Goodwill bag is revolutionary. Like the, there's a, a skill gap. So I think everybody in whatever way that you can, when you're out in the world, just kind of embodying or manifesting the different ways that you can relate to your clothes and far more than just to buy it, wear it five times, throw it in a pile and get rid of it. So, so go, go you, you guys are great. Mm -hmm. You complete me. <laughs> anyway. Does anybody else on the panel want to bring up anything else before I look at some of the questions that were submitted? Um, so a couple of people asked some questions about, um, about sheep and sheep farmers and thinking, asking a little bit about like, does anybody know like what people are doing to be able to produce more wool, like I guess in America, and then also like what could, um, what somebody wrote, what would you consider the most urgent need for our focus as crafters, like in relationship to like sheep and wool production? So, you know, Clara, Adrian, and Christine. I, don't <laughs> I was like, oh my God, we're all gonna race to like, ah! I, I, um, I, you guys can totally, totally follow up on this, but just demonstrating a need that, that, that no growth will happen until people see that there is a tangible need out there, that we will use these materials. So it is worth it for you to invest the time and the effort to make them, to whether it's from the farming itself to the facilities, like we do not have the equipment to process all the wool that we grow in the US right now. So um, just demonstrating a need, continuing to use it and being as omnivorous as you can about what kinds of wool you use, uh, that there is more than just one breed. And so, you know, helping educate other people that there are different types for different uses. Not everything has to be the super soft next to skin and, and just getting other people to, to understand the, the variety and also the longevity of these materials that it's just anyway, increasing consumption. I could go on for five and a half hours, but I'll stop there. Somebody else take it from here. Yeah. Um... Very passionate subject, uh, wool in America. So, um, and so much growth, right? Like, I mean, I feel over the past, especially five years, there's been so many more people that have come out with uh, yarn made from US wool, which is just tremendous. It's very exciting. Um, you know, I don't know how much people know around this, but, um, you know, like you can go to, let's say there's a very large processing um, facility called Charger, Charger, Chargers in uh, the Carolinas, and you can buy comb top from them, and then you can send that to a mill and have it uh, milled into yarn. Um, and that's kind of the slickest way to do it in, in to some respects, right? Um, the one thing is you don't know where your wool necessarily came from. You buy it by micron count for this, you know, so the softness of it. Um, and so that's a really like pretty easy access point, um, you know, into making yarn with US wool, which is phenomenal. And then from there, you kind of keep going into different segments. And in our experience, it gets a little bit more difficult and difficult, right? So um, one of the things that we have found that has been particularly challenging is um, a lot of the infrastructure that perhaps once existed um, to move wool throughout the United States is um, uh, disconnected, let's just say. So for example, um, some of the farms we're out working with, right? Like the person is shearing and there's no one to really skirt fleece. Um, so like we're there, we're skirting fleece. Um, and so we're taking off all the like shortcuts and poopy bits and whatever, and then bundling that. And then we might get it into um, like boxes, but you know, there's no one there to bale the wool. Um, and so for baling, what that is, is that there's uh, typically a, a 
hopefully knowledgeable person because you can clip your fingers off if you don't close the baler correctly, um, where you put the wool and then a um, it's kind of like a large garbage um, compactor. There's a compressor um, that presses the wool down into a you know Tyvek envelope essentially, which encloses the bale. And then you write the address of the mill on that bale and you, in our case, um, roll it physically um, into a semi. Um, and so like so much labor um, and then, you know, it's going to go to a mill and then there's different, um, you know, some of the mill equipment, it's really great, but it's older and, you know, you need someone there to be knowledgeable of running that mill equipment. Um, and some of that generation wants to move on and who's gonna move into those positions. It's an extremely skilled labor. Most of these things across the board are skilled labor. And I love that we're having more and more conversations during the pandemic around the amount of skill in terms of people picking our food, um, the whole nine yards, right? So um, yeah, so each one of those things means that the process slows down and it takes um, a lot of work on our part to connect those dots. Um, and so then when you know yarn comes out, that's a certain cost of money per potentially, right? There's then another, like, that's hard. Like, it's hard to charge sometimes the amount of money that we need to ask for um, for the yarn. And you know, it's a very great question. Why would you ever need to charge that much money? And especially when we kind of stand back and we look at the entire yarn industry and what skeins across the US wool paradigm cost within that. Um, so just know again, like kind of a big part I feel like of this conversation is that it, there's many complexities and many nuances to all of these things um, and many stories to be heard. Um, and yeah, I think it's staying really curious and, um, and listening to the different people across the United States who are working within these um, paradigms. Um, and so some of those uh, points of, um, that have broken apart are coming back together again, right? Um, again, with that, there is uh, more people wanting US wool and wanting to be part of this. So that is the really great news, um, but it's hard, like everything, um, you know, when you scale up, it becomes turnkey. So, you know, if you have a, a ranch with 3000 sheep, um, that uh, semi pulls up, um, they open doors from the semi, the sheep get on the semi, there's a shearing crew. They're just like going, 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 going through those 3000 sheep as fast as they can, shearing them. Um, and then they bail everything right there. They put it on the semi, it goes out to the uh, auction, to the, um, uh, the hub for the for wool in the United States that oftentimes goes off to China. Um, and if that farmer wants to get off of that and they want to not put their wool in the, the wool pool to be auctioned to China, they want to keep it in the United States. They want to even send it to chargiers to be processed. Well, there goes the semi. And so now what are they going to do? How are they going to put the pieces back together again? So it's very hard for them to also break out of that system because they're already working on such small margins with their wool. So anyway, I mean, sorry, I could talk about this. This is like one of, I think, such a fascinating topic that's going on in the United States um, to think about. Um, anyhow. Thank you, thank you. Um, Hannah, I know had something she wanted to say. Yeah, I just think that um, I wanted to add to these really high level discussions that Chris, Christine and Adrian are bringing forward through their work, these like production issues and supporting the farmers that um, Clara has highlighted through hers. My books are really centered on this idea of individual exploration and individual arming ourselves with knowledge. So if we can become more knowledgeable consumers and we know more about the wool's not just what their characteristics are and what makes them special, those things help us sell them to other knitters. So we can dig into these subjects on an individual basis and then make this change for the farmers, for yarn producers, by kind of sharing that information with other people who also share our craft. So in a really cool way, events like Rhinebeck, even when they're taken digitally like this, we can take things away from farmers that we encounter, brands that we peruse at 
stalls or on websites and then share that with other people. And that helps build the undercurrent, that demand that Clara was talking about. And I think that's an individual responsibility on the consumer to be more educated about the materials that we're using. Hey. Yeah, I wanted to just mention that, you know, what Hannah was saying that for me, you know, living in California, San Francisco, yes, it's Northern California, but not really uh, known for like hard winters. And, uh, you know, I started knitting and worked at a yarn store and that was when Manos and Malabrigo and Rowan, that was the heyday. And so those were my yarns, uh, the yarns that I thought of, uh, you know, and everything was the soft squishy merino and was really going to Rhinebeck for the first time that I encountered more of the sheepy wool. Uh, you know, I've always loved sheep, but it was really educating myself on the different breeds and, um, and then also meeting farmers. And, you know, by going to, you know, and sadly we aren't able to do it, but we can do so virtually, but even, you know, throughout the year that through social media, we can like be in contact with small farms and small yarn producers um, who are trying to do things locally like Brooke of Sincere Sheep, uh, you know, Amanda and Alberto of Prado de Lana, Tammy White at uh, Wayne Prayer Farm, and Choi at Middlebrook Fiber Fiberworks. You know, these are people who are doing like breed specific, small, uh, you know, sheep to yarn, and they have like online presence and you know that. So it's it, in some ways, it's like we it's there for us, and we can support these these you know producers. Um, and hopefully by supporting the smaller producers that, you know, and I, I totally take what Christine is saying that it's like, it's, it's like there's the small and then there's the large and that where, where is there in the middle? Um, and so Clara and, and Christine, like that's, I think the kind of like tearing, tearing the hair out part where there's nothing really there for that, like midsize it's, uh, you know, when you, um, being in Silicon Valley, it's all about like scaling and uh, you know, and and how how can we support that? And some of some some places do have, and I know that Verb has uh, clubs, and that you know it's almost like a a subscription service, and that gives people steady income uh, or guaranteed income. And so if you can support a, a fiber or yarn CSA that is local to you or uh, local to whoever's producing, that's like one way of guaranteeing an income and not having it be uh, just whenever you have the whim of like, oh, I need some yarn. And like a lot of these people are when these shows which have been canceled one after another this year, that that is a huge source of income that they've lost. Um, so it's just important as us to consumer, as consumers to, you know, be mindful of what we're, of where our dollars are going. Um, and I, I have found more and more that, especially with yarn, that I am buying yarn from people that I know or people that I've met, as opposed to, you know, from, uh, you know, labels or the, the, I don't know, we don't have the equivalent of the big 10, do we, or who knows what, but those are how, like, my, like, buying practices have changed in the past, like, five to 10 years, and it's really to do with, like, things like Rhinebeck. I'm just going to jump in and talk a little bit about um, what Christine and Clara were talking about this whole kind of broken yet recreated at some level um, supply chain because we're, we see the same thing with dye suppliers that um, I, I have a client right now who's really interested in having only US dyes and so but they're also really interested in a fairly large production. So that's there's not really anything that's available to them that we could actually run commercially that would we could actually do. So one of the things is I was speaking to them initially 
and and this was a restaurant chain and so they wanted to use some of their own um, um, food waste in order to create a natural dye so you know everyone's into avocados or onion skins and we looked at a, a number of those those kinds of things and I I just asked them point blank like you know how are you going to get these avocado pits from each of these stores to a centralized area that then goes to someone who's going to create the dye for you without the whole thing just rotting and you know they had this moment of like this really romanticized version of oh yeah we'll fix this problem but there was just so so many logistical questions that that they couldn't even wrap their heads around yet that um you know, as we move forward and try to create these regional or these larger domestic United States resources and suppliers that there's just this level of logistics that I don't even think that any of us know about quite yet. I would say wool and fibers, at least there was a tradition of it, but from the natural dye perspective, um, it's kind of a brand new territory. So just throwing that out for some, some ideas of kind of the struggles that we have between local versus, or hyper-local versus sort of regionalized versus um, being able to produce it and stabilize it and so that it could be used. So there's a few different questions that are in the chat. And there was one other question that um, was submitted to us earlier. Um, thank you, Kathy, sorry. Um, so, so there have been, uh, people have been talking about thrifting and thrift stores and both sides of this have been coming up. It's been coming up with this idea of like, if we take sweaters from thrift stores, then people who need sweaters don't have sweaters. Um, and people have um, also been kind of sort of just talking about as crafters, um, this question here, um, how we can offset the issues, which like Katrina, I think is something you were talking about a little bit, even with just like washing and energy use um, and everybody's brought up a little bit. So panelists, um, thrifting and choices about um, all the different kinds of choices we can make that are our own entry points. I mean, Katrina, you did speak to that before. So if we feel um, not, but that those, those things are kind of maybe our next little, our next topics. And actually it's, it's already a little late, so, but I think go. <laughs> Whichever panelist wants to chime in, it's fine. Um, I can I can jump in. I mentioned in the comments that I am kind of learning learning to thrift and some folks in the comments were talking about how one of the challenges they face when they go to like a Goodwill or Salvation Army or their local, you know, consignment thrift shop is scents, lack of choice, a lot of materials are poor quality materials. I was definitely having this like chafing point myself about two years ago because I knew that the most sustainable way for me to get new clothing would be to thrift it, but I hate going to thrift stores. So I started using all these apps and internet resources that have become available. I'm really fond of Poshmark as an option for thrifting. So a lot of people know that you can get fancy things on Poshmark for less money, but what I actually use Poshmark for are pieces that are made out of 100% natural material that I can then dye. So I will go through and like look for women's linen shirts in specific sizes or 100% silk shirts or materials that I normally wouldn't be able to afford on a tight budget that involves paying off debt and having a new house and all that kind of stuff. And it allows me to kind of find exactly what I'm looking for and then mend it or dye it to make it more of what I want. So for me, that's a whole new area to explore in thrifting. And if you were looking for unraveling sweaters, you could even look at an alternative like Poshmark for specific qualities. So if you knew that you wanted a red cashmere sweater, but you don't have the budget for cashmere yarn, you could see if you could find a secondhand red cashmere sweater and then unravel it and turn it into the sweater you want. I think the added benefit of this is also that it keeps people who have that higher budget point or that higher price entry point, even if it's only $10 more or the cost of shipping more, it keeps them out of the thrift stores, taking things that maybe someone who doesn't have the budget to shop online or the accessibility to get something in, in the mail all the time or go through all of those steps, or maybe they wanna avoid that carbon footprint step, they can just 
go to the store versus choosing online, you can pick an option that works for you, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Anybody um, else want to jump in on that idea of just the other kind of sort of things that that people can do um, in the, let me go back to Karen's question, right? Like your choices about your own energy use to live as sustainably as possible from a holistic rather than a siloed point. That's been brought up, but. Um, well, I think that, it, you know, it's interesting because even, even the word, like if we talk about thrifting that you know, it's this active going thrifting um, that it's a like a social thing. It's a, it's become a cool thing. Um, you know, I've been going to thrift stores for a very long time. Being a poor college student uh, and a single mother, you know, clothing my clothing my kid in in <laughs> in secondhand clothes because that you know it was just too expensive. <laughs> and interestingly enough, is you know as I have become uh, you know, slightly, you know, as I've climbed up the social ladder, uh, I think it was like my, my youngest son's first year of uh, high school that I thought like, well, we're going to go take you out to a store and, you know, and buy stuff. It's like, whoa, this is expensive. And then six months later, it was like, oh, you're growing out of everything. That was a waste of money. Um, it's like, that's why I didn't do these. <laughs> that, that's why secondhand is better. Um, so it's you know just that the gentrification of the word thrifting is 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 an interesting thing, um, and you know yeah there's the there's the whole uh, I don't know tension between what is being done out of necessity versus what is being done just to you know as a as a um, you know pastime almost, and that people they who have enough that just are getting more. Um, and I say this as you know, it's like okay, if you were to look at my closet, I'm 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 not a minimalist by any means. Uh, I am full maximal, a hundred acts of sewing, hundred dresses, you know. But you know, it is the as as Hannah was saying that buying things that are like natural fibers um, that if you can't afford something like say, uh, and you know, and it's also interesting to see different brands, big brands like say Eileen Fisher, like really cottoning on to this idea, cottoning, see what I did there, that you know, that there is a an after market value to, you know, when these things are made and can and can survive use. And then not to mention other brands like say Ace and Jig, where there's a whole like marketplace um, online. So you have that whole aspect of when you have aspirational brands, um, meaning that they're more expensive than say, like, you, you know, you have to think twice that you're not going to just drop like 30, 40, 50 dollars that you, it's it's 200. And so you have to like think like, oh, do I really want that? Um, and that those are being accessible to people by buying secondhand um, and that or brands that maybe we can't get here in the States because they're in Europe where their textile certification is, um, you know, so much more in place uh, than it is here in the US. Um, you know, it's, it's just, I think that it is, it is important important or uh, it is a, a good tool to have um, but it I don't think as as what we've all been saying it's not the like like ah oh, yes do this and then you know you will ascend and be pure um, you know I feel that making and upcycling and that's you know that's why I started making clothes was because I couldn't find clothes that I wanted to wear, clothes that fit me either off the rack or in thrift stores. And so it was actually Christine, who was one of the people saying, why don't you make clothes over and over again? And, you know, I finally succumbed, uh, <laughs> joined the cult as it were. But it's, you know, it's again, doing all of these things that there's not any one right answer. And it can be really easy to be disillusioned too when, you know, as, like Kathy and other people are saying that, you know, 
when you when your impact seems so small compared to other uh, these large companies, which are the gross polluters. But you know, I think that we just need to keep doing the best that we can and what fits well in our lives, and you know, staying curious. As I don't know if it was Clara or Christine who said that, but I like that. All right. Well, I want to honor everybody's time. It's four o three, so what makes sense for me to say, and anyone can change this, is that if any panelist has a thought that they want to just kind of sort of leave us all with, whether it's something that's really been on your mind, something that's new, something that's old, um, and then um, we'll say thank you and, and we'll leave this on so people can have a chance to unmute themselves and, 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 and say hi like for a few minutes afterwards. But um, thank you all again so much. There's so many different places to go. Kathy, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I'll start. First of all, I, I think just the fact that we have so many people who are interested in this as an as a question and issue. Um, there aren't any like, as Sonia said, there is no magic wand. There's no silver bullet that's just going to make this all better. This is a lot of work. It's going to be um, and everybody's going to enter into the work or the practice or the ideas from where they are. So that's okay. If, if these are the things that you can do and you feel like it's going to make um, the right kind of impact, then, then keep doing it. And I, what I've noticed in just working in this space for so long is that you just start to attract these amazing people into your orbit. So if they're not there yet, they're going to be. And just be ready for that because it just makes it so much more amazing of the stuff that you're going to be doing wherever you are. So don't give up. Um, the, the, the chat is amazing. I wish I could just kind of keep responding to it, but I'm, I'm going to not, but you know, you guys are doing great. So find it and keep working at it. It's slow, but you eventually get to a place where, you know, everything that you're doing is starting to connect and that really makes it so worthwhile. Any of the other panelists, any kind of thoughts? Okay. Um, yeah, what I've been really thinking about, and it's touching on what um, I think it was, uh, it was a comment in the chat about how right now the way that our infrastructure is set up, uh, a lot of these breed specific yarns from smaller places are prohibitively expensive. And for me, what I'm looking at is that until we make, um, larger policy changes higher up in the food chain, higher up in the government system, like there will not be room to expand the middle ground to make these kinds of yarns affordable, like for, for a larger consumer audience. So just something to keep in mind as you're going forward that it's not just um, supporting businesses that you believe are moving us in the right direction, but also understanding that there needs to be a higher level policy, how USDA treats sheep uh, and wool producers compared to how they treat poultry and the meat industry. Like it, that all has a huge impact, believe it or not, on what we end up with as knitters. So um, just uh, that's something I wanted to, in terms of expanding this and really making it realistic and not just a luxury item for the very privileged few, um, there needs to be significant policy change. And that's kind of what I'm hoping for. So keep that in your minds. And also just staying resourceful, um, talking about like thrifting or buying things online. Um, they're just tools to help you bypass a system that's been set up for you to acquire, right? And so the more resourceful we are about mending what we have in whatever way is relevant for us and acquiring it in a way, like I finally got a wool filled coat, but it was too expensive for me. So I went on to eBay, like, oh my God, I got a brand new wool coat and I beat the system. So um, just remembering to be resourceful and that you're the one in charge and um, go forward. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop, but um, yeah, we can do this, I think. We're Clara smart. Parks for president. <laughs> yeah, don't ever stop, Clara. Don't stop. A free sheep for everyone. Everybody gets a free sheep. No. So I just, oh, sorry. 
Go, Hannah. Oh, I was just saying that I love the conversation that's happening in the chat. I think these are things that every single one of the panelists, and I'm, can I just gush for a second about how amazing this panel is? I'm so honored to be a part of it. Um, I have everyone's books. I'm getting copies of everyone's new books. I can't wait to read everything. So if you guys in the audience are like, oh my God, ah, just imagine if you were me on this panel right now. But um, everybody is definitely continuing these conversations through their individual work. So if you want more information, like I learn so much from the other people on this panel and from what they write. And there are so many great movements out there. Like you just have to look for the information. Really, you're going to find so much of it. Well, I want to say thank you to everybody who came. Um, we're so sorry not to be there this year, though, as everyone said, everyone's happy not to be kind of pressed into the book section. Um, tomorrow we are doing um, at one o'clock, kind of a one o'clock brunch, we're doing um, a inclusion and representation in the crafting community panel, um, which should be really exciting. My guess is we're going to have the same password issues, so try Cousins also. Um, but is there is there any panelist who just wants to leave us with another thought? All right, I want to say thank you so much to Kathy, to Hannah, to Katrina, to Clara, to Adrian, to Christine, and to Sonia uh, for being with us, you guys. It was amazing to have this conversation. Um, thank so you, I Kira, guess for organizing this. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you could all unmute yourselves, I guess, if people want to say hi to other people, and I'll kind of leave this on for a few minutes. Um, and it is being recorded. I'll see how, where I can put it and, um, and like that, so. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Kira. So nice to see you guys. Yes, Bye. so nice to see you too. Bye. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye. Food for thought, thank you all. Waving Bye. to everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah,